Hey everybody, Dan Schinder here on Drum Talk TV and Yes Shift here with Steven Schinder. He's the father, I'm the son. Wait, I always mess that's, that up. I'm yeah, the father. Yeah, it's the other right? way around. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm older. I, I get it. I was going to say. Um, <laughs> he's more mature. That's why I get confused. And we're here with uh, out of a, over 50 year history. Only the third person to take the esteemed drum throne of one of our favorite bands, Biggest Influences. Yes. Welcome, Jay Shellen, who's done so many other things. We're going to talk about that. But Jay, how are you? How's the tour going? Great. Great to see you. Good to Great see, to see you. Too. We, we've been wanting to do this for a long time. I remember when I first started meeting Alan at his house and, and just getting friendly with him, he told me about Billy Sherwood, told me about World Trade. And shortly after that, you came along in the World Trade. But you've done so many other things. And one of our fans pointed out, in fact, let me grab her name real quick, because I want to bring this up right now, not wait for the fan questions. Stephen, maybe you can look for it while I ask. But you go way back with Yes, and, and you're, we're going to talk about how you met up with Tony K, what that led to. But you're the only Yes member in the band who's played with Peter Banks. Yeah, which yeah. is well, quite interesting. Well, Tony yeah, K. Uh, you're right. Yeah, Sanders. We were doing this. Yeah, I'm sorry. What was that, Steve? Who was it that asked that? Uh, Sanders Thornburg. That's right. Sanders Thornburg threw that in there, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's ah, right." So, it's, so it's yeah, great, it's a great question. Um, when we were doing the 50th anniversary, however, and Tony K. was joining us, right? Tony I was K. there. Or yep. had played with Peter, right? Yeah. And it, it's funny because that's kind of the connection that how it all happened is I was invited to Los Angeles to do a record by a buddy of mine. I was on the road at the time when I was 19 and I came to Los Angeles when I was 20. And that particular artist was managed by Tony K. And I was a huge fan by then. I had Badger. I had all the individual bands, you know, stuff and every, of course, every yes record and bootleg. Yeah, so I've heard all the mistakes, here. right? <laughs> yeah, I learned all the um, mistakes for sure. I, I know, I <laughs> love the that. mistakes. <laughs> yeah, and so I found myself just three hours in to California and going to Sound City, and we began working on this record, and it was managed by Tony K. I couldn't believe it. I'm just like, oh, well, this is amazing. And so he found out that I played tennis, and uh, we kind of cut the rehearsal early and we just went to the tennis courts. <laughs> so literally in that first day, that's I, great. Working at sound city and playing tennis with Tony. Did you, and, were you careful not to kick his ass this first time you played him? You don't want to you know, start the relationship off like that. I know, but it didn't cross my mind because he nailed me on a couple of, <laughs> you know, I come to the net and he just like passed me with ease and I'm going, okay, all right. <laughs> is it on and then we've been that way ever since That's we get on great. a tent and we just we just tear each other up man yeah um <laughs> so that they asked me to join bad finger mm -hmm. and with joey and tommy and tony right. and so i was playing with those guys as well and this club called the central it was run by english roadies now it's the Viper Room. Yep. But yeah. And and so Peter Banks wanted to put together a band and and play the Viper or the, the Central. And he Tony said, you know, ask Jay, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we started hanging out and we played the Central twice a week, doing all the jazz stuff, because he put together a really cool jazz band with horns and everything. Yeah. We were doing Miles Davis and all kinds of different stuff and then yes stuff and this kind of thing. It was really, it was great. And Peter That's was really awesome. cool. Hung out a lot. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So then, that. so looking into bad finger um, a little while back, I saw that the lineup you were part of might've been after the say no more album. Were there yeah. any studio recordings? I remember reading something about that, but what happened with all of that? <laughs> That's a good question. And 
something is going to happen, according oh. to Tony. Oh wow! Yeah, because we did a we did a recording uh, in Beverly Hills, you know, and so it's out there. And it was some really nice stuff, and it's the last stuff that that Tommy and Joey played together, and the last stuff that Tommy has recorded. And this was in the early '80s. Oh, yes. Yeah. This must have been maybe 80, 82, I two. think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 82. Interesting. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, as a drummer, I I've got all kinds of questions, and Steve's got questions, and we've got fan questions. We'll, we'll cram as yeah. much as we can into a shortish amount of time because, folks, Jay's going to take us out onto the stage and Wi Fi pro prohibiting or not prohibiting, allowing, he's going to give us a tour of the stage, but mainly his kit. Um, it's obvious that yes, you know, was an influence in Peter who might some influences be not just on drums, but on drums and also other bands, Jay, that people might not expect to hear, you know, sometimes as a prog artist or a metal artist or a tra traditional jazz artist, we get stereotyped that, Oh, well, that must be our only influences who, what might be some influences that would surprise people who know what you're doing now? Yeah. Well, growing up, I grew up in New Mexico. I'm from Albuquerque. And um, it's a real cultural town. Yep. Uh, one of my good friends who's older than me. I was playing with older musicians all the time. And uh, it was Randy Castillo. Oh. Um, I played with Ozzy and so yeah. forth. We're really John close. We were, yeah, we were Lita Ford. Lita Ford. Sorry, Lita. 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 Mm -hmm. the, the other one. <laughs> yeah. And, and so we were always doing drum circles at the Indian villages. And my grandmother lived uh, on the Isleta reservation there. Uh -huh. So we would always do that kind of thing. So that's an influence that I can't even describe. Oh, yeah. But it's about being centered and kind of trying to feel the pulse of things rather than think about meter. Yeah, yeah, there's a difference. And, and Tony Williams, then I was very much into jazz fusion and all that. And Tony Williams described it really very well. And Jack DeJanette as well, that I play the pulse. I don't play the meter. Right. Because, because especially, and this applies to yes, right now, probably always has been, except for a few 80s eras, it's it's flesh and bone and blood performing. Would like it be fair to no say? Yeah, yeah, I love the analogy. Would it be fair to say that meter is the math and pulse is the feeling, what you feel, and the cohesiveness that's, that's, amongst the players? Yeah, that that's that's a pretty astute way to say it, I think. Okay, because cool. meter is a more um uh kind of uh finite de de definition yeah it's set in stone it's time it's math yeah. it's timing our blood our blood pulses you know pulse is a little different yeah it, there's movement there so that so that's the idea so i i i played a lot of jazz a lot of jazz fusion uh my first instrument just like alan was piano mm. that was my classical piano for years and years but i walked through the drum store to get to my piano lessons <laughs> Oh, so, that's uh, go. the bug yeah. was there waiting to bite you. <laughs> yeah, those shiny objects. I couldn't get past them. <laughs> you know I mean? But um, yeah, so a lot of jazz fusion, Mongish and Orchestra, Return to Forever. Oh. Um, I love David Sanctuous band. You know, I, I got into um, a lot of my dad's old jazz records with featured D. Jeanette, Dave Tuff. Um, and I loved um, all of the Tony Williams stuff, Billy Cobham's things. Mahavishnu Orchestra. This was kind of my world in a way, but prior to all of that maturity, I was into um, Herman's Hermits. Oh. The Monkees, the Beatles, of uh -huh. course, right? Yeah. Huge. Right. And <clears throat> Three Dog Night. I thought Floyd Sneed was killer. Oh, he's great. Right? Yeah. And, and then Led Zeppelin came out. Yeah, we've heard and, of them. Yeah, exactly. 
And you want to talk about, you know, getting the blood moving, right? That, yeah. that, that changed a lot of things. So I started really feeling this, this, and that was very organic too, right? Blues, but played with something else that I hadn't heard yet. And mix all that in with the jazz and the whole business and all this stuff. I just had this feeling and these older musicians that I would play with, they taught me how to listen and jam. We would jam on Steely Dan stuff. We would jam on Allman Brothers things. We never left a song alone. There wasn't really an ending with these guys. And they taught me how to keep my ears open. And if you're listening and reacting and playing with your ears open, all these influences can have an influence. It's not that they influence you in the morning and then by the afternoon, you're not influenced by them anymore, right? <laughs> right. Good point. I like that. And then you, you know, you let it out, right? And that continued on because through that combination, I mean, that's the definition of yes, really. It's it's progressive, it's rock, it's organic. Mm. And I and I loved it. I it, so I was a Bruford fan. Definitely. Those early records, that was a thing, right? And yeah. then, But when Yes songs came out, the same thing happened to me that happened with John Bonham. <laughs> I heard Alan, who didn't have much time to pick up all this material, and you can tell by the way he refined it over the years. But Yes songs had that raw, pure energy. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it was visceral, man. I mean, yeah. we, I, that changed everything for me. That was like it, right? Mm -hmm. That was my guy kind yeah. of thing. And even though I'm influenced by so many others, you know, and, and I've been so fortunate through my great friends at Zildjian and um, Remo is to do different shows and clinics and gatherings with, you know, my, my heroes, you know, yeah, Louis Belton and, and, you know, just all these different people. And it's, it's an amazing, beautiful thing, but through it all, there was this Allen thing. And, and then by meeting Tony early, I was hanging out with all the guys. Mm -hmm. And um, then in Badfinger, he went over to do 90125 and we were taking a break. Tommy went back to England and then I went on the road with Danny Johnson and the Bandits and we were opening for ZZ Top on the Eliminator Tour, so couldn't pass that up. <laughs> right. Huge tour. Um, yeah. And so we would just all kind of be together at the Central, too, because it was an English roadie bar. And one time King Crimson was in town. And Bill was playing across the street and we all came over afterwards and this particular place, the central, I mean, I'm a 20 year old, 21 year old and in a booth in the corner every night is like John Mayall, members of Elton John's band, Dudley Moore. I mean, yeah. just the English folks, right? Yeah. And so it was a particularly crazy night that night. The King Crimson was there and Chris was there and Alan was there. And it was just like, wow, this is awesome. And I was the house drummer. Oh, wow. Bank. And then also I played on Bob and Keith's Tuesday night jam night. So I just would stay up there. Yeah. Okay. Who's coming in, you know? Yeah. And I got to play with so many great people. Some of the ones I just mentioned, you know, Robin Ford and John mm -hmm. Mayall and all that stuff. Um, and and I won't go into the details, but I was cajoled to go in the back room with a very pretty girl. <laughs> and so I was kind of neglecting my, my stage duties and I'm in the back and all of a sudden I hear, where's that drama? Right? <laughs> and anyway, so I go, oh man, I gotta go. And Chris comes through the door, you know, big as life. Yeah. And he grabs me and throws me over his shoulder <laughs> and he marches me out there and i'm on his shoulder like that and everybody's going oh my that's gosh that's so, stage, right? so crazy stuff like that was going on so much back then and so the influences continue 
definitely with Terry Bosio, of course. I mean, UK and yeah. even before that, all the Zappa work, everything. I mean, I, I that's one of the ones that goes back. Yeah. With the model and all that kind of thing. Um, Simon Phillips, very much so too, was worked with Jeff Beck, so on and so forth. Because I was really uh, um, intrigued by the, the rhythm patterns that could be created using ghost strokes. Yeah. You know, Buford started that in my head and then you pick up on it. And then, mm-hmm. but then there's a visceral thing about Terry Basio's rhythm, which is very, orga- and that's when I started thinking, if you watch a drummer's body language, he will tell you where his music and his beat is coming from. I love that, yeah. Because Terry would lean in and just, you know, he had this thing going and you could feel it in his, because the separation between the kick drum and the snare drum is everything. Yeah. Mm. If it's dead center, that's one thing, but you move the kick a little bit, leave the snare where it is. Now you've lengthened the snare note to the back of the kick, right? If you move them both, then you're just playing behind the beat. Yeah. You leave the kick there and you move the snare back very west coast, right? Then you shorten the distance. Yeah. Hang in so, front of it. Yeah. So there's a different, it gives a pulse thing. And the body, that's kind of how you end up doing that naturally, is in your body motion, digging an Allen. Oh, shoulder, yeah. Yeah. Right? So there's a lot to do with that. It was very much to do with that. So even their body language was influencing me and everything. And I would just take all that and developing my own voice, which was just like a gumbo. That's cool. <laughs> you know? We, so, uh, well, go ahead, Steve. Oh, I was just going to say, so the central <laughs> is where you were able to play with Peter Banks, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, how was that? It was great. He was a really very free and easy player. Very, um, oh, how would you say, uh, kind of sparky. Mm. He would just get up there and he would just energize and just yeah. go. And it, it was a lot of fun. And we hung out after every show at his apartment, hanging out there. And as I had just kind of gotten to town and, and uh, the band was, was really good really tight and we were doing a lot of crazy things and in the <laughs> afternoon or in that evening we would discuss what he wanted to do the next day and it would sometimes be off the wall it'd be like a really kind of new version of a miles davis tune or something like that. Mm. So you better let the horn, Scott the horn player know because he's going to have a heck of a time he goes no wow, we're going to do it we're going to do it so it was really spontaneous <laughs> Yeah, again, you had to use your ears. Yeah. And I had my heat sheets. You know, it looked like I was throwing napkins on, on the floor. <laughs> right. <laughs> All cheat sheets. And we would just play and play and play. And I, I got so much work out of th- those performances. I was doing lots of records and sessions and all these different things. It was That's just great. fortunate. I mean, to this day, I'm just so grateful. It's- yeah. That's great. So let's do this, folks. I'm going to, we're popping in a clip of Jay playing while he takes us out to the stage. When we come back, we'll be out on the stage and he'll give us a tour of his kit. Then Steve's going to ask another career question that's more contemporary for Jay. And we'll read some, some fan questions too. So check out this clip of Jay.
So we're back. I hope you enjoyed that clip of Jay. And here is Jay in the cockpit. You know, there's a reason. There's a reason why piano players are on a bench and guitar players sometimes sit down on a chair or a stool. Drummers are on the throne because they are truly <laughs> the kings and queens of what drives a band. Right, Jay? I agree, man. That That's it. We were banging on the logs and, and, and we were the communicators. Exactly. You know, Other than the voice, we were the first instrument, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So let's see if the Wi-Fi holds up. Right now, Jay's fro <laughs> frozen. Sorry, that was I, I was faking that. But Jay actually he is frozen. There we oh, go. Oh, he's back. He's Wait, back. Now we're back. Now we're back. back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I may have it. Okay, so Jay, give us a, a quick tour of your kit, and then you can run back to the dressing room area, and we'll finish it out there if the Wi-Fi gets weak yeah. here. Here we go. There we go. Nice. Go yeah, it looks great. I'll ask you a couple of questions. Anything you want, right? Here. Yeah, it looks like. Oh, yeah. Looks like the ride symbols and a custom is the whole setup. That same series, or do you mix and match a bit? No, I've got K's. I've got a lot of dark K crashes. I like great. those a lot. Um, I use these effect symbols yeah i love those yeah i have fun spinning nice. them during the show and everybody kind of goes wow that's bad. <laughs> what is that um this is and i like ping rides it's nice. an a custom ping um but you can see the crash is pretty much oh dark hammered k. hammered dark k yeah yeah which i love them because that's the other thing um that i keep getting messages so yeah here's more effect symbols, and this is interesting. For and you and I, I play a physical crotale. Oh, where is it? Oh, there it is. Yeah, now we there can. Yeah, nice. Yeah, very you know, cool. It organic, right? No electronic. Yeah. Very and, uh, cool. Yeah, and your toms, um, the front toms, are those all the same size except for one of them? No, no, they're they're. Let's see. Let they look the out. same from the long shot. Let me see if I can flip here real quick. Okay. Let me do a flip. Where's my, how do I get to it? Julian, do you know how to flip? If I want to flip my shot? There should be a camera icon with like circular I arrows. I need to flip right. mine. Okay, there it is. Ah, there we see? go. He's a he, Julian extraordinaire. He's the man. Cool. Okay. So much easier. Yeah. And if you turn so, it, if you turn it horizontally, we'll get more in the view. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So no, they're all different sizes. Okay. Eight, eight inch. Uh -huh. Right. Ten. Mm -hmm. Twelve. Fourteen. But it's a square drum that John Good made for me, so it's a little. Nice. It's not quite as deep. Yeah. So it's fourteen by fourteen, which sounds really tight, really cool. Yeah. That's cool. Then 16 and an 18. Nice. And the kick is a uh, 22. Cool. And, uh, 9,000 pedals, mm -hmm. double pedals. And uh, yeah. The, awesome. For, for Relayer next year, we're going to get into some more adding on to the kit. Uh, Great. Because we had planned to to do this together, Alan and I, and, and I designed a double drum riser. Oh, wow. Well, that we could share. Um, and then we could, it rotated. So at times there would be uh, his set featured, then it rotated a little bit, then there'd be my set featured. And oh, then cool. it, you could, then, then you could center it, and then we both were just slightly off angle of each other, and we both were going to play Relayer, right? You right. know, Gates to Delirium and all of the stuff. So there's awesome. the front. Yeah, and beautiful. So we're going to add some stuff into some different areas on the set for that year. It'll be a lot of fun. That's cool. What is your snare, Jay? Is it nickel on chrome, or it was hard to tell? Yeah, basically, I have two, and uh, one is when I when I was performing with Alan, 
there was a, a big difference. This this is my DW version. Oh, and it is it's solid copper. Oh, nice. And it's amazing. It sounds unreal. And when I would perform with Alan, what we were looking for is something that didn't change in volume too much. Yeah. Uh, also kept the the consistency of sound, you know? Yeah. And it just so happened that in my years early on, I wanted that Alan White's, you know, sound, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what what did I have in my closet? <laughs> it's a Ludwig. It's a nineteen seventy three Ludwig hand hammered. Wow. That's amazing. Snare. So it was almost identical, although I gotta say Alan has one of the most unique snares on the planet. Yeah. It is yeah. incredible. Can you show me how to flip that again? And I'll talk to you guys. Yeah. Let's see, is it flipped again? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for that tour. Yeah. yeah. So that snare was really, really special. And this one seemed to match it just perfectly. And cool. we're, we've integrated, you know, the, the DW snare now. Yeah. And the heads are clear Remo ambassadors on top and bottom, or are they emperors? Uh, ambassador bottom, emperor top. Got it. Um, Very cool. I would love to use ambassadors. Uh, they would sound so crisp and expressive but they would last one show yeah yeah that would be so a single could, fly. yeah yeah and and uh the remo emperors are the go-to just yeah love them the just love them i have the uh on my big kit which is a big progressive kit i have the color tone heads and they are basically um the ambassadors but colored you know or emperors rather and and they sound great. And I don't have bottom. I haven't had bottom heads since 1983. I just, really? Yeah, I just love that open breathing sound. They just sound so good. Yeah. Phil Collins. It. That's Phil Collins. Yeah. Baby. He was another big influence. <laughs> yeah. Brand X, Genesis. Oh man. All that. Yeah. Even Huge. back in the day, um, Carl Palmer didn't have bottom heads. And yep. uh, when when Alan in the Tormato tour. Um, had the some North drums mixed in, drum. you know, same thing with Billy Cobham. We had the clear fives kit with the big couple of North drums. Um, yeah. Neil Peart had a bunch of concert toms with it. You know, it's very old school, but I just love the sound and it works. It works. So my old guy, old school, what can I tell you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that all the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. And this is working. So we'll stay right here. And Steve's going to move the conversation to a more contemporary career question for you then we'll read a few fan questions and get you done in time for the line check okay yeah so uh, i have a couple at the moment uh one of them um we recently watched that video of the alan white tribute uh, concert in seattle so what was yeah. it like getting all that together and the set list like is there any like behind the scenes stuff you can share well um we we were finishing our tour of japan Right. right just prior to that so we literally had two weeks maximum to finalize what we had been discussing in the weeks prior to us leaving to japan and there was so much to get worked out there and i gotta give everybody a whole lot of credit and alan's wife Gigi did so so much she she put yeah so much love and her heart and soul into that and it, it was a lot of work and everybody came together and whatever we needed to do we were going to get done you know what i mean yeah and that was the spirit and the spirit was so strong and i really enjoyed playing with the white band uh the day before at the salmon days festival oh and yeah that's was, right yeah and and that that was it was just great. I mean, you, you just even even in the UK and Japan this year, where we were honoring Alan and playing the memorial, you know, footage. You yeah. Know, was put, it the room was filled with love and warmth and just the greatest vibes you could ever 
play a note of music in. You know, that's awesome. It's uh, yeah, it's like stepping into your grandmother's arms or something. You know what I mean? It was just yeah. It's just love everywhere, right? I was going to say that totally reflects him, you know, because that's just kind of guy you exactly, are. Exactly. And the same at Seattle. It was it was just a lot of love, you know? And I yeah. mean, there was, there was moments that were very lovely and difficult. One in particular was when Imagine was coming up and uh, Michael DeRozier had been on the, the set that I was using um, or I would, I was going to be using and Michael's a really tall guy. So I had to do a little bit of adjust. You know, yeah. And be, behind me was John Lennon and a lot of footage of those sessions and such and this and that. And then it finished up with a close up of a very young Alan yeah. right, right there behind me. And yeah. I was kind of starting to to lose it just a little bit. And then the opening notes right. of Imagine began. And I just turned around on the set and then we played Imagine. And it was hard to describe. It was beautiful, yeah. I think. Magical. It was a great tribute. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Cool. Yeah. So outside of Yes, uh, you're also in a band with some other guys we may have heard of uh, it's a band called arc of life <laughs> <laughs> so um and of course the nice. second album the second album don't look down is coming up in a few weeks i think on the 18th if i'm not mistaken so what yeah. can you tell us about the upcoming album and future plans with the band and how it might differ from the first album what what could people expect or and as much as you want to leave to surprise that's fine Really? Yeah, surprise is always good, so I won't give away too much, except that I think you're going to find that it is a bit more exploratory. Oh, across. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's where our roots are, and, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of what, what's coming out at, at, the, at the moment, you know. And, and will you guys uh, tour? Well, it's, it's something that's always on our mind and in the, the realm of possibility, but yes, it's very busy. You know, especially with Relayer right. coming up and that kind of thing. But yeah, um, there is possibilities, you know, cool. maybe getting together with some of our other prog band friends. And, you know, and Billy's playing and uh, in uh, Asia, of course. Yeah. Jazz. So they've got plans, etc. So for now, I think it's always on our mind if we find an opportunity. So we would hope cool. to, we would love to do it. Yeah. Something to consider, if I may throw something in the imaginary suggestion box, with mm -hmm. everybody's such busy and staggered schedules that are probably a lot like a checkerboard, perhaps you guys could plan one or two, you know, a few months apart, live stream concerts where maybe there's a few, you do it at a venue where it's easy to get a few people mm -hmm. there, but make it a, a live stream thing so people can still experience you guys performing together without worrying about a crazy tour schedule. Yeah, that's so funny. I was just talking about that with uh, the nice gentleman that drove me here. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, the way it's going. I mean, because after being in Vegas with Rating the Vault Ball so long, yeah, the, audi the audience comes to you, right? Right. And all the travel involved and things like that. So it's coming. It is definitely coming. I know what you mean, though. The streaming from different locations. Yeah. That, I mean, during the, the great pause yeah uh, people were experimenting with that there was a lag issue to a certain degree especially with volume kind of instruments and trying to give a real cohesive performance yeah um but it's coming right yeah coming. A and a i would love to see that and a couple of the quick things i don't want to forget about or leave untouched before we if there's time to go to fan uh questions is yeah. two things one talk about rating the rock vault and then tell everyone a bit about your book as well and where they can get that. Okay, sure. Well, Rating the Rock Ball um, was a production. It was written by John Payne mm -hmm. from Asia and David Kirschenbaum, who's a Grammy Award winning writer and producer. 
So it began off the script. I won't go into it too graphically, I guess, but it was a very involved thing of we had messed up our planet. We wanted to send our culture and our beloved items off to other planets. And if we get our stuff together, we'll go back and get them someday. You know what I mean? It's kind of like we're squirrels. <laughs> we're basically yeah. interstellar, right. stellar squirrels. Okay. So that was a rock ball that got shot off. Mm-hmm. And then later we did get ourselves together and we went and rediscovered the rock balls. And when it opened, that was the show. That's so, so we, cool. went, we went from the 60s all the way through the 80s and stopping at the, at the 90s. And it was an all-star band, Hall of Famers, platinum artists, everything. And yeah. um, uh, it was an amazing show. It was at the LVH, the International. Mm-hmm. The yeah. Big, for that. big one, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. 3,000 rooms, the Rat Pack, the whole. That was where Elvis did his. Yeah. That's his Bobby thing. Morris, the drummer Bobby Morris for Elvis was his uh, musical director there for 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Legendary yeah. place. You got a picture of Bobby. I have it right here. Bobby gave me this. Who's one of my first. Drum Talk TV interviews. Mm. Oh yeah, there's a dude. Look at him. Yeah, yeah. look at all. Oh, look at the two of them. Yeah. yeah. Back in you the got... day, the Las yeah. Vegas Hilton. Yeah. How do you so... get? How do you get rid of a venue like that? Is it... I know. <laughs> or even rename it. It's just dropping. I know. It's it, it, crazy. It gets, it gets sold and it changes, and you know. Yeah, it, it, some things kinda... need to be left alone. You know. Yeah. I agree. I yeah. agree. That sounds um, like it was a fun gig, though. It was an amazing show. It was amazing. There was lasers, dancers, actors, everything, and an extreme band of the most amazing singers and everything. And we were just having a ball. Audience would come to us. It was great. We, we did the uh, LVH. Then we bounced over to the Tropicana. Then we bounced over to the Hard Rock. And now it's still playing at the Rio. Yeah. Um, in a different form. It has had to kind of scale down a little bit from the big old, you know, days. Oz. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but some of the best times, some of the best times ever. And it's, it's true for all of us. You know, That's great. Time there. And, yeah. and talk about your book, your unique book that talks about some unique techniques for drummers. Yeah. Um, this uh, is a technique that. When I was uh, about 16, I worked in uh, Lucchetti Drum and Guitar Shop. And we had some great clini- clinicians come through and this and that. And I got to meet them all. And I get a lesson from all of them. You know, Louis Belson and, and uh, Billy Cobham and uh, uh, Buddy Rich, uh, Ed Sonner to see. Oh, wow. You know, I mean, just all kinds. And I learned so much from all these guys. And Alan Dawson. He's a drummer, jazz drummer that taught at uh, Berkeley School of Music. Mm -hmm. He came and I set up his kit and did everything and I got my lesson. Right. But what I had noticed when he was playing is that he had a left foot that was doing something amazing to me because no matter what he was doing. This left foot was just like it was on automatic. I was thinking, what is going on? And so he. He said. I'm going to show you and it's going to change your life basically. Right. Um, so not to get in too much detail or lengthy detail. The idea is Julie, can you flip this? Is it okay if I flip this and I'll show yeah, you a couple? Of absolutely. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I see you go to that. I got you. Okay. Cool. So the idea is, is for a drummer to have a solid seat, Right, so that you you can engage your core and feel centered. Yeah. Low. So you 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 feel solid, solid, right? Um, so some drummers will bounce. Yeah. Um, if if you're on a stool like this and you lift this foot off the ground, you you you're, you lose balance, right? Mm-hmm. One foot's coming off the ground. See, here I am, centered. Lift this foot off and. So now you have to compensate and then you're playing the kick drum with the other. So there's a slight state of imbalance, you know, you're kind of right. have things on the ground at and off the ground sometimes at the same time. So the rocking motion is basically 
a motion that will give you a quarter note sound if you want it, but your your foot is in an eighth note motion, so you're higher up the denominations. Oh. Right? And you can control volume just by how you do it. You can move back for another check. Right? So That's interesting. If, if you were going to play your ride with it, if you just you play all eight notes. Right? Yeah. And then if you feel like changing it and you want to put it on the end, it's so very simple. Heel down first. Oh, okay. How so cool. Heel down, then it goes on the end. And then if you were playing, I call it super halftime. Right? <laughs> super so, halftime. Yeah. You can go to 16th on it. Oh. Boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? So you can yeah. put space. And, and the thing that it does for you, you could do it even when you're sitting on a stool anytime, is you just go ahead and let your foot keep the time. Yeah. And it is automatic. I, can, I could make a sandwich, order a pizza. You know? <laughs> right. It doesn't matter. It, it will stay where you put it. So I use a song starter, which is just a simple metronome that moves in a you know, kind of pendulum manner. Yeah. And then I just lock this foot onto that. And then I count in the song. And then the song can maintain the pulse. The That's pulse cool. like we were talking about. It's not yeah. hard time like a click. Right. It's pulse. And you just learn, if you learn it early enough on, you learn all your techniques based against that as a quarter note, but in an eighth note motion. So with yes, it's particularly awesome. That's <laughs> I mean, great. And that's, little... I'm sorry, that book is at jshellen.com? Yeah, and we're currently sold out, but I'm going to get some new, um, you know, books into production. Cool. Uh, oh, nice. I might be teaming up with uh, a publisher. Through... It's hard to describe. I, I use clear laminates in it because the left foot and this is one ostinato pattern right? yeah then there's beats kick and snare and exercises to develop your left hand and your foot and the whole thing as the, the secondary so those are printed on a page the left foot and the right hand are a lamination that goes over the page oh that's and then you neat get, you, get them, you can get 25 different laminations of different ways to play this. So you pattern. just overlay them differently to get different results, yeah. different patterns. That's smart. Exactly. I like that. And it's or, it's 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 organic. I did it in 90, what was it, 90, 93 or four or something like that. That's um, so I've been approached about turning it into something that's more web based or CD ROM based and that kind of thing. So Great. I'm going to be working. Nice. For sure. But and I'll tell you, it allows me to play all the polyrhythmic stuff like look at close to the edge right yeah <laughs> four, four four half time or six eight it depends on how you want to count this thing, right so bill yeah the whole thing playing half time but thinking six eight yeah a relayer uh and gates to layer i think of another one with that you know you know all those different polyrhythmic yeah. parts yeah, That's so cool. with this automatic pulse, it's going to move against everything. Right. And if you're comfortable feeling a bar of two, you know, basically, because it's one, two, one, two, really flowing through all the eights of six eights and seven eights and 13 eights divided and subdivided, right? And, and I can see how that would naturally it's improve perfect. someone's timing as well. You know, there's yeah. no way it won't. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're smooth. You know, you can you can navigate complex corners and all this stuff. Just listen to Steve Smith. Yeah, one of my, one of my yeah. favorite. He uses this too. Yeah, right? and Carrie Lynn Carrington. Yeah, Carrie Lynn Carrington. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, and talk about space. The yeah. space yeah. in between the notes. It's so important. So this yeah. helps you get that. That's great. Thanks for that. 
Steve, why don't you kick us off? We'll take turns reading some fan questions. There's a couple we've asked. There's a couple that I also I'm like, oh, wow, I was going to ask that. So we left some for the fans as well. Go ahead. <laughs> OK, great. you still got a few minutes, Jay? Yeah. OK, cool. That. OK, go for yes. it. Steve. So uh, further and one of the questions that we have is from Adam Parrish, who is actually the current keyboardist for Gordon Kill Trap. So that's yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it says, hi, Jay. I would like to say well done for stepping into the big shoes, which Alan left. I saw the UK tour earlier this year, and you did an amazing job. When I listened to your playing, I can definitely identify the Alan and Bill influences. I was wondering if there will be any further Unruly Child releases in the near future. I really enjoyed the album Our Glass House. Yeah, I think Unruly Child is going to carry on just like an Unruly Child should. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and in its unruliness, we'll never really know exactly how or when, right? right. But it's always going to carry on because, I mean, the songwriting team of Guy Allison and Bruce Gowdy and Marcy Free is phenomenal. You know, so those songs, you know, I'll, I'll hop in any possible time I can do. So I would just Here say I'm really child. Gonna just live on. For sure. nice. Here's a question I love that I was gonna ask. This is from fan uh, Gina Casulo. <laughs> and she says, and I, I know there's 10 answers for this, Jay, but see how, how take the challenge of, let's see how much you can narrow it down. So if you need to hear from over, that's cool. <laughs> Does Jay have a favorite song he likes to play live with? Yes. And is there a particular song that he'd love to play live that he hasn't yet? Ah, and then I'm going to add to that question after you answer. I can do that. I can okay. do that right now. <laughs> I am narrowing it down. Let me just okay. say that first. Okay. Right playing close to the edge is so much fun. It's so much fun because it's, it's just once, once you really have dived into that, right. Um, it's just kind of the same thing in a way as Gates of Delirium. Yeah. It's like into a Picasso painting, you know, it's going to yeah. just take so close to the edge right now. So much fun to play. Um, and what I would like to play is Sound Chaser. <laughs> it's yes. coming up. It's coming Great. Up. We, That's have, awesome. we have the whole tour down and then the pandemic hit because we would have been playing it in 2020. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to going back to that. Just, cool. Yeah. So I'm going to add to that question. And there's two ways you can two ways you can answer it, one or the other. So is there a song that you would love to play that yes has either never played live or haven't played in a very long time? So what comes well, to mind, you yes, know, things uh, like from Sound Keith Chaser, Sound Chaser falls in that category. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it does. Like long, long time. But uh, oh, let's see. What would it be? What would it be? I mean, Steve keeps threatening to, to bring out 5% of nothing. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. funny. Um, uh, wow. Let's see. What haven't we done? I, I would like, like to do... I would like to do the other sides of topographic. Yes. Oh, I love that. We've done, we've done ritual and we've done revealing. Just so you know, time. correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. I, I would love to. And, and we've talked about it. I think that could be coming. That's great. And and, and me this also. Whole, this, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, me also being a fellow Yes Bootleg collector since I was 12 or 14, I have the original all of the Tales concert where they they also only played Close to the Edge and then Roundabout. I have that. <laughs> I've, I've got everything from like 1974 forward, I believe, or 73 forward. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. that, that's I've, got some deep, I've got some deep stories I'll tell you guys privately. I don't know if it's for all of this, but. Yeah, we, we could always do this again. You know, this is an open yeah. door. Yeah. Yeah, Steve, yeah, yeah. Why don't you give us another fan question for JC? Yeah, Stephen Sullivan asks um, about would like details on how you learned the tracks on Relayer, and if you also had any advice from Alan on that, or isolating bits from the 
5.1 mix or just listening to the record over and over like in the old days like how do you approach relayer well i listened to it and this is why i was able to get topographic oceans down so quickly for that tour because i only had three days notice yeah, that's to do a the great drama tour. topographic tour is i read all of the hobbit series and the lord of the rings oh. and the whole thing to topographic oceans and relay are playing in the background so subliminally they just sounded like songs to me from the beginning they just sound like songs i knew yeah. every i knew where it was going i knew where it was coming from there's never any issues with that so then uh i i could identify the parts and i know the parts um then the the, the struggle to come up with is the motivation and then to me, look at the body language and try and ev- imagine the body doing these things. So I, yeah. I really saw a lot of visualization in a way. And I've known Alan for quite a while. When I would ask him details on certain things, he would tell me certain ways of like how they counted the beginning of ritual, you know, just those hits and stuff. Yeah. And so I went, oh, well, that's interesting. They used to love to toy around with certain things. You know, yeah. just for fun. And then they became parts, you know, and it was all counted in eight. And that's why they sound like softballs just dropping in the middle of nowhere. Right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would just uh, do those two things, learn the parts, play to the records until I could feel exactly what he was feeling mm-hmm. it, it, in my mind's eye. Yeah, and be able to execute it smoothly, and with passion, and listen to the dynamics, and I gotta say, every yes song in the process of learning is a ten layer cake. Yeah, yeah, because you can get the first five layers, and you can burn the song. You know, it ain't deep enough yet. Yeah. All of a sudden, another layer exposes itself, and you go. Oh, and then another layer. And then well, I like layer. that yeah. you use the term exposes itself because the more you learn, the more layers you get, that's how you see those other layers underneath. Because now you got that part in your mind and you're not, it's not, yeah. Cl- yeah. those other parts aren't clouded by that because now you got that. It's a really interesting yeah. process. And that, yeah, I, I mean, there, there's a reason it's called relayer, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, this is why this. Music, I believe, is always going to live yes. in the minds and hearts of so many people because it's got those layers. Yeah, and you can you can spend I, years analyzing one song. Yeah, and, and where it came from, to how it was recorded, to then how it was performed, and then how did they live perform? Mm. It's yeah. all it's all this this. It's amazing thing. Yeah, it's like a living, breathing organism when you put it that way. You know, the studio version, the live version, which tour of the live version, you know, all these different, those are additional layers, you know. I I listen to all of them and including ABWH. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was an interesting take on Close to the Edge. Yeah, that's Steve's favorite version, actually. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Really shows one, hopefully not anymore. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i listen to all that stuff and it all goes in there and then more layers are exposed and then pretty soon boy you're down to it and that's that's a great place to be but it doesn't happen quickly cool we'll we'll take one more question i'll pick one more all right um how about let's go with let me just scan these real quick Uh, we're gonna okay. Some of this we've kind of covered in. Uh, okay, we got that. I just saw one that went okay. Um, so are there any who who's on your your bucket list of a few living artists that you would just love to work with that you have not worked with yet? Yeah, and that question's from Julian Ruiz. Oh, by thank the way. you, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Julian. <laughs> yeah, who's on that bucket list? Wow, 
Wow. Well, yeah, it's, that's, that's, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. But um, what could that be? Cause I'm kind of like sitting right in the middle of the ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, seriously, it's so like think that. outside genre. Think maybe outside yeah. the box a bit outside genre and who. Well, I like to play with Chick Corea. Cool. I mean, I love Dave Weckl and his style is so cool. And that would just be so, so much fun to get into. Um, it would be fun to play around with King Crimson. You know, oh, would be yeah. really good. Frip, and I mean, I like Brian Eno. Do you favorite have a favorite album or tour you'd like to retour with them? Mine would be three um, of a perfect pair. Not in particular, I suppose. Uh, Court of the Crimson King. Yeah, you know, and, classic. Yeah, all that stuff. And then conversely, I'm also a big fan of uh, Willie Nelson. Oh, really? Oh, nice. oh yeah. Is really he your nice weed thing. connection? Just kidding. I, I said, is he your <laughs> oh, weed oh, connection? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I love playing behind a melody, you know, and I love yeah. supporting singers. Sing, that's really what I, I love that, supporting yeah. singers. We're so fortunate to have such a fan, amazing singer, beautiful singers, John Davison. Absolutely. Know? And amongst the complexity of all of this, I'm still thinking of supporting and, and giving the singer the, 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 yeah. the support for all the majesty possible, right? So yeah. a lot of country music and stuff like that, it, it appeals to that side of me, where it, it's, it's finding the exact right place for the beats, being reliable and give everybody in the band supreme confidence to groove yeah and that whole and thing space is like to do their thing you know yeah exactly and you just you do it and smiles are everywhere and it's yeah. just like yeehaw yeah that that's a that's a really <laughs> wonderful bucket list Thanks for sharing that okay good and good, and thanks. jay we'll do this again after the tour after your home settled we'll get together we'll talk more there's always so much to talk about especially with drumming and especially with yes what a great combination we're simulcasting this on both of our our programs on all of our different channels i'll send you links please say hi to billy i've known billy since yep. 1997 alan introduced me we had steve how on about a month ago three weeks ago a couple weeks yes, ago a yeah. couple weeks yeah. ago it was tell tell yeah. him we said hi um i will and and the other guys i don't know if jeff or uh john will remember me but i've met jeff a few times with alan in working with alan so just wishing you guys well i'm sorry i couldn't be there in person but i'm glad we did it this way so steve was able me to be too. a part of it and carry the yes shift side yeah 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 this is great this is great. awesome really had a good okay thanks, thanks everybody, everybody so much folks you can follow yes shift at facebook.com slash yes shift you can write us with ideas or or love mail, hate mail, whatever at yesshiftpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us the audio version on anchor.fm and find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash is it yes shift? Uh, yes, not not yet. Just search yes shift on YouTube. Okay, just search yes shift. I'll, and I'll Trump, that out. <laughs> and Trump Talk TV is like a giant yeah. amoeba blob. We're everywhere. Over a million fans on Facebook.com slash yes shift. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Vimeo and a new platform, TikTok, and another new platform soon to come that'll blow your Whoa. your minds, folks. See, I couldn't even get out. Thanks, everybody. Wow.